Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. I'm quite happy to see a lot of you joining us despite the bad weather. Usually in Cyprus, once we get some rain, everybody goes away and hides. But thankfully, a lot of you showed up. And thank you, Joanna, and the Center for Entrepreneurship for hosting us here today to talk to you a bit about financing, entrepreneurship, and crowdfunding, which is what we are doing. Um, just to give you a bit of an overview of what we're going to cover, just a quick uh, introduction of who we are. We're going to explore some startup funding options that we have here, specifically in Cyprus. We're not going to talk more generically. Uh, we're going to go over crowdfunding, and we, if we have time, we can view a few more bonus topics, as we described, about, again, startups, financing, and all that. Uh, we have some time for Q&A at the end, but we want to make this session as interactive as possible, so please interrupt us, uh, and let us know if you have any questions, and we'll be more than happy to answer. So just a quick question for who we are. I'm Frixos, I'm the co-founder, one of the co-founders of Crowdbase. Uh, I've studied in the UK, I did economics and finance, and then I uh, studied financial analysis for my master's degree in London. Uh, that's where I met Panayotis, who is the deputy managing director in Crowdbase. You wanna say something? Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Let me introduce myself as well. I'm Panayotis. I also studied in the UK, a uh, bachelor's at LSE in London, and then my master's in at the London Business School, where I met Frixos. Uh, after uh, London Business School, I worked at the uh, Ernst and Young in Nicosia, in the strategy and transactions department. Uh, I worked for about nine months when uh, Frixos gave me the call to join him at his venture at uh, Crowdbase, and uh, yeah, here we are. <laughs> so this is a prime example that perhaps one of your co-founders or one of the first people you're going to partner up with if you go down this entrepreneurship route could be sitting next to your, be one of your classmates. This is one of the most common ways to get started usually. Um, and a few words about Crowdbase, we are the first investment-based crowdfunding platform here in Cyprus. Uh, we are regulated uh, by the Cyprus Security Exchange Commission, and we just started ourselves. We launched our first campaign in uh, November October. last year, October last mm -hmm. year, and it was called Easy Boat. Any of you have heard it or perhaps seen any of the advertising? One? Okay, we need to, to reach a bit more of the younger crowd perhaps. But for example, Easy Boat was a new venture by the Easy Group, like EasyJet. Uh, by Stelios Hadjuano, and they wanted to get this exposure for their new venture, uh, which is essentially renting boats. And yeah, they, they chose us to fundraise some money for the new startup, and they raised almost half a million. And everybody who have invested in that from as little as 100 euros, and you essentially get shares in the company. Uh, before we, we proceed, uh, is, is anyone here a founder or is anyone here thinking of starting a business anytime soon? Yeah. Okay, cool. Can we share um, a few ideas perhaps? Um, or is it not ready to... Will, you, will we be protected? Yes, yeah, so <laughs> we, we have everybody here now. Yeah. <laughs> this is a formal agreement. <laughs> oh, we have a recording too. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps we shouldn't disclose it if, if it's right. confidential. Uh, have you tried anyone uh, raising capital for your uh, startup, or uh, no, you are not there yet? Mm -hmm. no. yeah. Okay. Maybe MVP yeah. stage, or you thinking about it? I'm thinking about, thinking about it. it. Okay. Cool. Okay. We're gonna see how this plays. So, one of the biggest hurdles for any startup is raising money, and uh, because it essentially allows you to develop yourself and progress and survive uh, for a big part of the startup lifestyle, which is usually up to five years, you essentially are burning money. You don't have, you, you won't be making profits. So it's essential that you have this fuel to progress. Um, unfortunately, in Cyprus, we have quite a bit of a challenge in raising money for new ventures and exciting ideas and perhaps a bit more risky ideas. This uh, is due to the entire financial system uh, that has been damaged over the years. Uh, but there's still a few options you can pursue. And this depends on the stage of your startup. So uh, if you are just starting off, you will probably pursue a different route than if you have been working for three, five years and you have 500,000 in revenue or sales. So at the very, very early stage, you usually would go to an accelerator or incubator where they will uh, give you all the resources you need in order to set up the company, 
figure out your business plan, uh, form your idea into an actually, you know, business generating uh, company. And um, they sometimes want in exchange some shares in the company, a small percentage, usually five to 10%, but that's, that's you're worth it because otherwise if you, ha you have paid for these services, it will have cost you hundreds of thousands. Uh, as it says there, there, this is usually for early, early stages where you want perhaps to explore uh, your idea, see what other experts are thinking about it and how they can help you achieve uh, your goals. In Cyprus, we have a few of these. We have Idea Innovation Center uh, by Bank of Cyprus, which runs a program every year. Uh, it's quite popular and some of their companies have uh, went to do fairly well. We have Cyprus Seeds, which is more for academic ideas so if you are working, if we have any PhD students or anybody who is doing research and you want to transform uh, an academic idea into, um, into a business, actually business, then you can do that. And there's also ARIS, uh, I think it's by Deloitte in mm -hmm. Limassol, mm -hmm. that's a bit further away, but essentially does a very similar thing to idea. Um, yeah, let's see. Then you can also pursue the grants route. So grants are great because they, you essentially get money for free, uh, that's in quotations, because they don't require you to give any percentage of your company in exchange. But the problem is that these are usually very competitive. When you are giving out money, everybody wants some, exactly, right? And uh, what happens is usually that there is more demand than supply and you need to be quick, you need to uh, apply for these grants, you need to uh, you know, uh, uh, comply with all the um, potential regulations or requirements they might have. Um, one of the problems we have faced with grants in Cyprus is that unfortunately they are not always structured for startups. Um, they might be targeting startups, but unfortunately we, what we have seen, especially from IDEC and the Research Innovation Foundation, is that they put very restrictive obligations like don't, don't begin selling your product or services before you get the grant, which is a bit counterintuitive. So I would say be careful when you're pursuing this route. Uh, we have also received a lot of people uh, coming to us and telling us, oh, I've, I've, uh, I've been accepted for this grant, but I, I don't wanna take it because it would es essentially kill their business. So be a bit careful. But other than that, there's a few more by the finance ministry and the ministry on energy and commerce. Uh, and then there's angel investors. Uh, angel investors are usually high net worth individuals. So people that have been successful in their field, in their business, they have done really well. And they have made quite a few, uh, they have made uh, a lot of money. And they are, then they are looking for the new exciting thing to invest in, to participate in and um, contribute in development. Um, they usually invest between 25,000 and 100,000 um, and they, they can also offer a lot of very good guidance. In Cyprus, uh, this network is not very organized. We have one organization which is called the Cyprus Business and Angels Network or Cyban, which you can approach and you can pitch to them. Uh, so that's one option. And then we have also venture capital funds. So Venture capital funds, they are supposedly the most, uh, let's just say intimidating in many ways because they have strict requirements, they have specific sectors they want to invest in, and they, they, if you get an investment from these companies, you need to push yourself quite a bit and scale up in order to make it worth their time. Um, in Cyprus, we, again, this is a sector that is lacking quite a bit. And there are a few funds. So KV Fund by Guinness Ventures, they are actually looking for some investment opportunities right now. I think they have a call out until March. So if you, if you have something that's brewing, perhaps you can talk with them. Um, there's also Wide Beam, which is by two very successful entrepreneurs in, uh, in Limassol. And they're also looking for some investments, but they have a, bit, a different theme. They're looking for socially impactful investments that would help the day-to-day -day work uh, and lifestyle of the Cypriot people. And then, and then there is also the Cyprus Equity Fund. So I don't know how many of you have heard of this, but 
the, in, the, in an effort to promote entrepreneurship in Cyprus, uh, the Cyprus Government Association with the European Investment Fund, they are setting up this uh, new fund that would invest in Cypriot startups. The competition has ended and the winner has been uh, selected and the fund is expected to begin in February and March. So you should expect to hear a bit more news about that and perhaps their process of selecting these startups. And uh, I think it's going to be around 30 million with investments of 250,000. So there's a lot of money to be given out and they will be looking for a lot of opportunities. Um, yeah. And lastly, crowdfunding platforms, so ourselves. So crowdfunding takes a different approach. Crowdfunding is the process of combining a lot of small investments for individual people. Um, what that means is that anybody, uh, including yourselves, can register in one of these platforms and invest in a new startup um, from, for, for a very small amount in exchange for shares in the company. Um, a few examples over there, as I mentioned, ourselves, Kickstarter, Crowdcube, and Seeders. So I'm pretty sure most of you must be familiar with Kickstarter. Uh, has, yeah. Has anyone used Kickstarter, perhaps? Yeah. Just to explore. Just to explore. So the, in Kickstarter, when you back a project, you usually get a product in return for your backing. You're essentially supporting this company to produce something. Uh, the difference with our f type of crowdfunding is that you would get shares in the company. So you get a piece of the company. Um, and there is also lots of different types of crowdfunding. So I'll just hand it over to Banyans right now to talk a bit more about the different types of crowdfunding, which ones you can we can use in each different case. Uh, thank you. So, uh, do, you, do you have any questions about the financing options? Uh, anything else you'd like us to go into more detail, maybe? So basically, a startup wants some capital come to you and you uh, and sells its shares to you and you uh, with within you you they, you they you sell to some low investor like you said a hundred euros mm. so we basically just let's say you get from the startup 20 percent shares to sell and basically you sell them you take them apart and you sell them like one percent two percent three percent yeah, uh, what do you do? yeah, very similar to that. We have a section later on that will explain exactly the process of crowdfunding. So I think let's leave it to that one mm -hmm. and try to answer yeah. it. For crowdfunding specific related questions, let's wait for this section and, and then uh, we, can, we can help you answer. But basically there's a price per share and everybody buys uh, the specific number of shares according to the amount they invested. That, that's the, yeah. So um, yeah, uh, crowdfunding. Crowdfunding, it's, we are raising capital for a business or a venture from a lot of investors, and usually with very low minimum uh, investment amounts. Uh, investing in, in private businesses in the past was only available to high net worth individuals, angel investors, where they had the opportunity to invest from 100,000 to 200,000. And then if you were a small investor having like 1,000 to invest, you couldn't access these opportunities. Now this changed over the last approximately 10, 12 years with, with the introduction of crowdfunding. And now everybody has the chance to invest in these uh, startups and gain access to these opportunities through crowdfunding. Uh, in return, uh, investors receive different financial or non-financial benefits according to the type of crowdfunding campaign we're going to explore now the four types of crowdfunding. So the first type of crowdfunding is equity crowdfunding. Essentially with equity crowdfunding, you uh, invest your money and in exchange you gain shares in a company. That's pretty much it, essentially uh, that's it. This is what we do at Crowdbase in addition to debt crowdfunding where uh, if a business wants to borrow money, instead of going to a bank to borrow this money, it can go to, this, to, the, to a platform and uh, borrow this money from individual investors. So essentially, these investors uh, lend money to a business and the business uh, repays them back over time with interest, mm -hmm. like a bank. The, so, sorry, yeah. so a very simple way to think about it is 
very similar to what you would do, how you would invest with Revolut. So if anybody has used it or any other investment platform, you would choose the stock you want to invest in, you choose the amount you want to invest in, and you click invest, and in return, you get shares in the company. So this is exactly what happens with our platform as well. The difference is that instead of having um, a traded, publicly traded uh, price, you have a private company. So you wouldn't be able to sell your shares as easily as with other uh, types of investments. But that, that's just different, uh, that's the difference between the profile of public and private companies. Okay, thank you. So we have equity and debt crowdfunding for now. So essentially in, in both of these uh, types of crowdfunding, uh, the people that give money to the platform, they are, they're, they're essentially called investors. They invest money, so they, they take a risk in their investment. They might not receive anything back. So uh, it's, it's, quite a, uh, it's, it's a risky uh, business, and that's why we have to be a regulated entity by SISEC, by the competent authority in Cyprus. The third uh, type of crowdfunding is rewards-based crowdfunding. With rewards-based crowdfunding, backers, not investors, backers, pledge money to a, to a, to a project in return for a, for a product. We have a very uh, successful uh, Cypriot startup, Hegemonic Project. Is anyone familiar with Hegemonic Project here? It was also no? part of the idea. Uh, yes, is an idea alumni. Uh, you. I, I encourage you to check out the hegemonic project uh, after the lecture. Uh, by the way, we are going to, in, in communication with Ioanna, distribute this to uh, every one of you that is interested. And uh, everything that is underlined is a link, so you can follow the links and uh, find everything you, you want. Uh, so hegemonic project is a, a board game, a strategy board game, uh, and they used Kickstarter, and they said, okay, we want to produce this board game, but we don't have the money, so what do we do? Let's go to Kickstarter, create a campaign, raise the capital needed to uh, manufacture this board game, and if we reach our goal, we manufacture it and send it out to the different backers that uh, backed our, our um, project. And these uh, guys, they managed to raise 600,000 from 10,801 backers from Kickstarter. I encourage you to check it out later. And the final uh, type of crowdfunding is donation-based crowdfunding, where uh, people uh, donate money for specific causes and charities. Anyone can, can go on these platforms and create a campaign to raise money for, for any uh, charity-based uh, reason. GoFundMe is, a, is a, uh, the, one of the biggest platforms for donation uh, crowdfunding, and uh, Kickstarter is the biggest platform for rewards-based crowdfunding. Yeah, so depending on what you want to achieve and what, what your business is or what your project is, you can choose, you would choose a different type of crowdfunding. So, for example, the board game industry is very attractive for the rewards, but if you're offering some kind of service to, to other companies, that would be very hard to do a rewards-based crowdfunding. How would you give this service to each company or each individual that supports you? It's quite different. So depending on what you achieve, you would choose a, a different product. Sorry. I would like to ask how safe is the Kickstarter? Yeah, so... I mean, copying the ideas, how safe are the mm. ideas on the web? Okay, two different topics here. Firstly, how safe it is. We're gonna talk a bit about Kickstarter. So the big difference between some of the investment crowdfunding platforms like ourselves and Kickstarter is that Kickstarter doesn't need to be regulated. So essentially they can do whatever they want. They can have somebody going on their platform, say, okay, I'm gonna build a rocket ship without proving that they have the necessary uh, knowledge or expertise or uh, backing to do so. And then people can just go in, if they believe him or her, uh, if they believe them, they can still back them. Uh, so that's the main problem with Kickstarter. In contrast with us, uh, we, verify all the information and the people behind each project to ensure that each investment or company, they are true, they are, they are doing what they said they are doing and that it's a good investment opportunity. Um, now, the second part of the question, sorry. IP remember? protection. IP protection, yes. This is a very common question that everybody uh, asks. 
So why um, shouldn't I be worried that I go out there and broadcast my idea to everybody and I'm, I'm gonna, that I'm gonna do this thing in this way and there's a big danger that somebody could steal it or copy it or do the same thing. So how I would usually answer this question is that let's imagine you are in a race with everybody else in executing this question. If you have, let's say, 15 second head start with them in this, let's say, 100 meter race, then you shouldn't be that worried that somebody with such a late start would be able to overtake you. If they do manage to copy your business and overtake you and do it better than you after having a year or two uh, in like advantage of developing and setting up and all that, then perhaps you were not the right person to do this business. Um, and yeah, this is my opinion on the topic and th that really depends on whether you um, believe that the execution of the idea or the ideation is more important. In my, my opinion, the execution is more important than the actual idea. In any case, you should try and secure all the patents that you can't, mm. but uh, if you can't, then... What, what Fixo said is... Okay, so uh, why should uh, you raise capital with crowdfunding? Although raising capital, raising funds is the main goal, crowdfunding comes with some other uh, potential benefits that could help you uh, grow your business uh, in comparison with other uh, financing options. First, we have the concept validation. A, a successful campaign means that uh, you manage to, to reach your funding goal. That means that you manage to uh, convince a lot of investors to invest in your company. So you have that as a proof that what I have worked, what I have uh, works and is uh, trusted by the people. You can say, for example, 200 people uh, believed in my business and invested in my project, so you can much more easily uh, go, go and raise additional funds later from institutional investors, for example, because you have this track record of raising capital from a lot of investors and that many people believed in your idea. A lot of these investors can also be customers. So if somebody, for example, let's take the example of Easybo mm -hmm. that we just did. If somebody is a big yacht uh, enthusiast and goes yachting every summer and they, they had this struggle of finding the best rental for them, then they, are, they, if they feel the need for this tool or this service or this product in the market, then they will most likely invest in you and showcase to other investors that yes, there is a need for this mm -hmm. product. Yeah, they will become advocates yeah. of your product or service, these, these investors, which uh, a lot of the times happen to also be your users. Um, marketing exposure, huge part of a crowdfunding campaign is the marketing exposure that, uh, that it provides you. Uh, we have um, coordinated marketing efforts ourselves from our side and the company from its side and then uh, we coordinate together to uh, market to a lot of people uh, and uh, and the company also gains access to our customer base our investors uh, so you gain access to all of these potential target markets and then you can uh, target um, uh, you can target specific audiences uh, most likely uh, we recommend that we target your users because your users are the most likely ones to invest in your company because they are using your product or service, they know you, and because they are using you, they must be, they must be satisfied with that, so uh, they are most likely to, to invest in the company. But in any case, uh, we, we allocate a lot of the, of the revenues that we receive from, uh, from, the, from the company in marketing as well to help with the marketing efforts uh, of the campaign. Uh, another potential benefit of crowdfunding is the crowdsourcing of ideas. Uh, because you, you, you open up to all of these people and all these people see your idea and uh, invest in your idea, they might have something that uh, it's worth listening to. So uh, you will have a lot of ideas coming from these people and then as a founder it's up to you to filter those ideas and either act on them or not. But in any case, you get a, a huge influx of feedback and ideas that you can use to make your business better. 
and uh, lastly is the efficiency uh, imagine you're trying to raise capital now and uh, your how would you go about it you will talk with this investor and then you talk with this investor and this investor requests this information and that investor requests that information you, you will have to go a lot of places talk on a lot of the phone with different people um, um, say the same things over and over again to all those people with crowdfunding we centralize all this we all this information into one location which is the campaign page so we help you do that uh, in the best way possible we think uh, and all of the information an investor needs is on the campaign page so uh, it saves you the time essentially to answer all those questions again and again and again so you can focus on running your business so a few words on how we work at Crowdbase. Let's say, for example, you have a startup now and uh, you like what you see here. And then you say, OK, um, I want to raise capital with uh, Crowdbase. So how, how does it work? Uh, so how we work at Crowdbase, uh, a lot of people, businesses approach us. And then we do this first screening uh, process. Um, this screening uh, is um, usually questions and uh, due diligence, and uh, we, we want to accept projects on the platform that we ourselves would invest in. That's, that's our, our motto. So if we don't believe that this is a viable project, this is, this is a viable opportunity to put in front of our investors, then we won't move on. But if we like what we see, then we will proceed. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see later on also a few topics on what the investors are looking for and subsequently what we are looking for. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we like what we see, then we request additional documents and then we proceed with the KYC and due diligence procedure, what Frixo said uh, a couple of minutes ago, with uh, verifying the identities of the people working at the company, verifying the validity of the documents, of the accounting, of the of everything that the, that the business does. Uh, and uh, we, uh, yeah, okay, so. This would be quite hard to do as an individual. So if you, you're gonna invest a thousand euros in a company, it would take you probably two, three weeks in order to do this process. So instead of putting this process of verifying all the information and making sure that all, everything is all right with the business, Instead of forcing each individual to do it, we do it ourselves in order to make sure that nobody else needs to do it. Uh, and hopefully people trust us that we do this correctly. It's a very important part of any investment uh, to make sure that what, what is presented to you is actually truthful. Yeah, uh, provided uh, that we are happy with the business, we think it's viable, uh, uh, we pass the KYC checks and all that, we finalized our agreements on the valuation of the company, on the minimum investment and all that, then we proceed with launching the campaign. <clears throat> and then, we, as I said before, we coordinate with the company uh, to coordinate on a, on a marketing campaign that is coherent on all fronts. Um, campaigns usually last for one to three months, uh, depending on the fundraising amount that, uh, that you need, but uh, we, we, we think that the sweet spot is somewhere around two months. Uh, while the campaign is live, uh, anyone can start investing uh, in, the, in the company, usually from 100 euros. Some campaigns have uh, higher uh, investment amounts, but we encourage our startups, especially for equity campaigns, to set the minimum uh, at 100 euros so that it is accessible to a lot of people. And this, I think, goes back a bit to the previous question of how it actually works. So the money of the investors, they all come in to us, as, and then we hold all the money into a special bank account. And let's just say that at the end of the campaign, 100,000 is collected. Then we go to the company and we tell them, okay, we have 100,000 investment. Uh, each of your shares was, let's just say, one euro. So you need to issue 100 shares, uh, 100,000 shares to this investor. Let's uh, say it goes five there, 10, 20, 30, 50, whatever each one invested. And then once those shares are issued, then the money is released to the company. And I think, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And uh, it's, it's also important to note that uh, investors are direct, have direct ownership 
in the company. So these certificates, these share certificates are issued directly in each investor's name. So there is no intermediary risk. So <coughs> these certificates are not registered at Crowdbase. So for example, Crowdbase closes, then you, you're left with nothing because everything is registered at Crowdbase. That's not the case. Everything is registered in each investor's name. So we don't have the intermediary risk. So what is the disadvantage of having a lower minimum than 100 euros? If, a, if mm. one share is one euro, why don't you say have a minimum or what's the towards 50 euros or one euro? It's mostly logistical because uh, for us to onboard a user, we need to do um, have a questionnaire, do a proof of, get proof of identity where, like Revolut, you scan your ID in order to make sure that it's original and so on. So the cost of that is usually around three, four euros. That's why we keep it at a hundred because I mean, a lower investment wouldn't make sense for us or the company. Ah, question. James, what so. happens in the case that uh, you said that you are collecting the money mm -hmm. when you have the full amount? Yeah. You proceed with the transfer. Mm -hmm. What happens in that case that uh, the crowd base uh, closes during the collection mm -hmm. of money? Mm -hmm. Do we lose the money? Does the yeah. So uh, it's a very small window, but <laughs> still it could be a possibility. The answer is no. There is an invest investor protection fund in Cyprus, which protects uh, investments up to twenty thousand, I think, uh, in mm -hmm. when they are in this state. So it protects your money whilst we are holding them on your behalf. And um, even, even in the case that your investment is more than 20,000, because they're in a different account than our money. Called the client's yeah. funds account that we cannot use for any other reason. Mm. The money will still be there. So even if Crowdbase goes bankrupt, we owe money, let's just say, to everybody. Those, the, the client's fund money are separated, they're segregated, so they can't be affected. So the money will be returned. It's not like FTX. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone familiar with the story there at FTX? <laughs> so yeah, so yeah. Th this is something yeah. that FTX was not doing. They were taking this money while they were saying, oh, you know, we are holding it on your behalf. Yeah. And they were making these crazy bets mm -hmm. on, on other cryptocurrencies. On, uh, on our side, we, we cannot do that. We cannot it, touch that money. Yeah, it it's it's clients' money. And it's, nearby it's that we would yeah. go to, pre to prison. Probably. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's unfortunate they didn't apply the same theory to FTX, and yeah. FTX had a license in Cyprus. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's for the courts to decide yeah. <laughs> without blame. And uh, yeah, as we, we, we already covered this, once the campaign successfully closes, uh, we make sure that these uh, investment certificates are issued in each investor's name. Uh, if that procedure ends well, then we transfer the money to the company and then they proceed with doing what they promised they would do uh, after raising the, the money. All right. Any, uh, any other questions on this uh, topic, uh, maybe? How do you sell your shares? Yeah, so one of the big and I think good requirements that crowdfunding, uh, that the regulation has imposed to every crowdfunding platform right now, is that you should be able to freely sell your shares uh, to whoever you want. So, so for just a bit of context, when in the past, if you invest in a limited company, so an LTV, and you want to share, sell your shares, you can't do that freely. You need to first go back to the company and the existing shareholders and offer them the shares first and they can say no or refuse to, sell, to buy your shares, and you're kind of in the locked in. Uh, with crowdfunding, as companies that do crowdfunding, you, need, you must enforce this um, policy that you can freely sell your shares to whoever you want. So you can sell it to your neighbor, to your friend, or whatever. Uh, what we are trying to do on our platform is create like a bulletin port, which is, is not exactly like an exchange. It wouldn't be as easy as, say, sell on, on uh, um, Revolut, but you would essentially go out and say, okay, I got these shares in EasyBoat or whichever company through Crowdbase, and now I wanna sell it at 50% over the price I bought it, or, or lower, uh, higher, doesn't, depending on how much you want to sell it. And then interested buyers can come to you and say, okay, I accept your offer, 
I want to buy it, and then you do what you call, what is called a listing of transfer, and you transfer the shares from one person to so, the other. So you need uh, another person to buy them? Yes. And then like a sport or, or they like sell, mm. and I immediately get the money. Of the no, there is a, so that's the difference between private companies and listed companies. When a company is listed in a, an exchange, so let's say Apple, there is so many people that are buying and selling at the same time that that can happen instantaneously. As soon as you say sell, it, there's somebody out there buying. But with these companies, because they are not listed in any exchange, you, it's it's the manual process of finding somebody to buy these shares. And it's manual, so I have to find it, or can I find it through your platform? Oh, you can find yeah. it through our platform. That's what the bulletin board yeah. uh, essentially will help you to do. Yeah. Uh, you will express your interest to sell uh, your shares, and then uh, interested buyers might see your uh, your expression for, for selling and then they will approach you and start negotiating on the price. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Isn't the value of the share like constant throughout the, mm. or I so, mean, does it change throughout the... Uh, we can't, in reality it changes. It changes and depending on demand and supply. So the supply is limited, you know how many shares are out there, so it's mostly demand. If somebody really wants to buy these shares because let's just say easy vote is doing really well, it's in the news, and it's becoming very popular, then the demand rises, so you, you most likely can sell it for a higher price. The problem with private companies is that you don't have this reference price. Nobody's gonna come and tell you it's worth X, or you know, it's, not, it's worth 10, 15, or 20 euros. That's up to you to uh, estimate, mm -hmm. figure out, see how much you wanna make. So if you bought it at one euro, and you want to make up of your money, you will need to sell it at two euros, and then it depends on the other side whether they want to buy it or not. The best estimation you can do is mm. let's imagine a scenario where uh, next year EasyBoat raises one million from a VC venture capital fund in, in Greece, for example. That will have a valuation. Mm. So, in, in a year's time, they will raise one million at five million valuation, for example. That's your best estimation. Uh, for the valuation of the company at that time. So, so e every financing round of a company, you get yeah, some okay. solid information yeah. uh, on where the co this company is going in terms of valuation. But if there are no financing rounds, it's, hard it's a bit harder. Yeah. Yeah. Usually there is one every you need, year or two. You will need uh, full access to the company's books and everything, mm -hmm. so you can perform your own valuation. And who says that your own valuation is the correct one? So it's a bit of a guessing game there. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, negotiating with the other person. Mm -hmm. uh, question? Yeah. Ah, yes. Excellent question. Excellent. Yes, good question. We're not a charity. We're also <laughs> a startup where we want to make money. And uh, how we do that is based on a commission if the campaign is successful. So uh, that means that if, if they target, if the campaign doesn't actually raise the money they want, we don't ca get paid anything. But if they do, then we usually charge around 7% of the money that is raised. So on 100,000 invested through our platform, we'll make 7% also, 7,000, sorry. So we get from the company, not from the... Yes, yes, exactly. Investors Inve do not pay anything on our platform, mm -hmm. for, for now at least, yes. Uh, no transaction fees, no exit fees or anything yeah. like that. We wanted to make it as simple as possible for the investors. You invest 100, you get 100. Mm -hmm. the, the fees goes to the company. Mm -hmm. You're right, because I heard that you use the future tense a lot. I would be thrilled. Ah, oh. <laughs> no, we, we are live, we're working. We already did one campaign. Do we have access to internet here? Maybe we do. But the, uh, the, uh, he mentioned we will uh, or we might, because we are, as we said, we are a startup and our business model is changing all the time. So we might offer some other services that we would need to charge the investor. So yeah, this is our platform. Yeah, so this is our website, and okay. this is e the EasyBoat project. Yeah. Um, as you can see, we raised this amount of, uh, they were looking to raise anywhere from 250,000 euros to 650. Mm -hmm. We managed to raise 469,000 uh, from 141 investors. And this is the kind of information you can expect to find on a typical uh, campaign. So this is the pitch. Um, I'm, I'm jumping a little bit ahead, yeah, I think. Gonna, yeah, this is the next topic. Yeah. Okay, before uh, you no. go to the next one, so I was gonna ask. Okay. So the next topic is, and as if I will showcase a little bit, 
is the information that investors are looking for. So let's try to put yourselves in the shoes of the investors. Um, let's just say a friend of yours comes up to you and is like, okay guys, I figured the next big thing is gonna be the next Facebook, Apple, Meta, whatever, and um, I want you to invest. What do you want to ask them? What do you want to know about them or their idea in order to invest in them, in order to trust them, in order to, for them to prove to you that this is actually a good idea? Do you have any guesses? Yes. How much do you want and when do you tell it to me and start making profit? Okay, this, yeah. this is a good starting mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. uh, this covers the financial it, Yeah, this say. covers the financial, but then the question is, Let's, I, I come to you and I tell you, oh yeah, I'm gonna give you back your money in six months and I'm gonna give you 10 times your money. It's, it sounds good, but the question is- that Is that acceptable to you? Yeah, can they do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would you prefer you see the background of, uh, let's say, the team? Mm -hmm. Yes. And you ask for uh, maybe some prototypes or some work they have done on their idea? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. this is very team. excellent, yes. For me, at least, the team is perhaps the most important aspect when assessing uh, a business idea. And oftentimes what happens is that good teams, very clever people, are doing the wrong idea. So what that means. For example, my background is in finance and the other co-founder is in technology. So what we ended up doing is a fintech company. Uh, we could have sat around and thought, let's just say, what's a common idea? A lot of people come to us, for example, and tell us, oh, I want to create the next uh, restaurant booking app in Cyprus, because we don't have that, and it's hard to call the restaurants, and then uh, we heard this idea about five to 10 times in the past year, but the problem is, although a lot of people have thought of it, and a lot of people want to do it, they are not the right people to do that project because they don't have the connections with the restaurant industry, they don't have the background that is required to get all these restaurants on board, or they don't have the technical background to build this platform. So if you're thinking of a good idea or you want to become an entrepreneur, what I would say, and you have like a friend or two or a co-founder that you want to work with, I would say look at your own skills first, see what you can do, what you can offer to this new business, and then figure out what you want to do instead of finding an idea and then forcing yourself into it. So yeah, very good. So yeah, Tim, other, other, other yeah. I will, I will ask him if there is a similar product mm -hmm. and why his, why his product is better than mm -hmm. the other. Yeah. Competition. So competition, and this is a very good point mm -hmm. also. And one of the classic answers is that there is no other, there is nobody else. There is no <laughs> competition in this. And um, although it might sound good, uh, on a, like when you hear it, oh yeah, you know, we're gonna be a monopoly, this is great, uh, this is amazing, we're gonna just capture all the market and it's gonna make all this money. The reality is, if there is no competition, there is two problems. First, the company doesn't realize there is competition, so they haven't done correct market research to understand the landscape and who else is out there that might compete with them, or the other possibility is that they haven't done, again, enough market research to see that whether there is demand for this product. So the reason that a lot of these other entrepreneurs might not be trying to do this service is because nobody wants it. It's because there's no market. Yeah, there's no market <laughs> for it. There's no demand for it. So again, very good point. Anybody else? Anything else? Okay. I think okay. we have earned a lot of them. Yep. Let's see what else we have. So the problem. What is the problem you want, uh, trying to solve? And this is the, uh, another common mistake for a lot of startups do. They are trying to solve the problem that nobody doesn't has, exist. doesn't yes. exist. Uh -huh. So it, it might sound very good in theory, oh, you know, I'm gonna do this, this, and this. And it's super cool, I'm gonna use all these amazing technologies, but the reality is that it, there isn't, that this problem yeah. doesn't exist for other What's people. the customer's pain point yeah. that you're solving? If yeah. there's no pain point, then why bother doing that? Mm. And I, I think this is very apparent with a lot of this Web.3 uh, mm. Web hype and cryptocurrencies and blockchain. So a lot of the problems they were showcasing that they were trying to solve, they weren't really problems. They were just an existing service, existing product, um, product and they were just 
putting a cool technology on it just for the sake of using a cool technology. And perhaps we might also see this with AI now, with all this hype coming mm -hmm. in. Um, so that's the one. The solution, okay, I'm gonna say how you are actually gonna solve the problem. Yeah. So how, how does your product or service actually work mm -hmm. and how, does, how is it used to solve this problem we described mm -hmm. uh, earlier? Yeah, the business model. So how are you gonna charge your customers? Like you asked us before, how do we make money? Is it commission? Is it a referral? Is it a product, one-off? Is it a recurring revenue business that's very popular right Subscription now? Subscription-based, SaaS models, based. yes. There's a lot of them. Um, but in reality, uh, the, the very successful ones are, I think, seven. There's very, seven very successful models. I, I won't try to uh, name them all right now, but YC has a very nice podcast that they analyze how uh, a lot of their companies, in reality, use the same business model, just applied to a different uh, industry. Um, the target audience, uh, saying that you're gonna sell this to everybody is usually not a reality, and uh, you're probably just gonna waste a lot of money. Uh, market size, as we mentioned before with competition, is there market to actually sell these services to people? And is it large enough for you to grow? Mm -hmm. Or is it just a very niche, small market, for example, targeting a niche in Cyprus, for example? Is that large enough for you to be successful? So, for example, for us, we are starting off in Cyprus, but our target is to go abroad, to go to Greece, to go to Eastern Europe and countries uh, in Europe in order to have a bigger audience. Uh, the team, as we mentioned before, extremely important for us. The roadmap, I think you also mentioned that before. What have you achieved up to this point? and how are you gonna reach your end goal? If you tell me, okay, I'm gonna create uh, the next Facebook in one step, one swoop step, without you know any intermediary uh, steps, yet then you clearly don't understand what it takes behind the scenes to run <coughs> such a company or platform. Competition we mentioned, use of funds. How, what are you gonna use my money for? Um, and is this a good idea? Is it just gonna be all on salaries or on fancy offices or nice or ping pong tables in the office. That's not very useful <laughs> for the actual investors to get their money back. And the financials, as you mentioned also, um, <coughs> in the end of the day, how does it, does it make money for me as the investor? What I'm going to get back from? How do you see how the, uh, the customer gives the funds? Yeah. When you're the cloud base, yeah. you're going to give my money. Mm -hmm. How do you know that this is for example, board is going to use the that yeah, as an investor, you get quarterly updates and the audited financial statements that you can do, see what the funds were actually used for. It might, it usually is not, you know, exact science. So if they say 50% of the budget is going to go marketing, maybe it's 40, maybe it's 60, it can vary a little bit. But if they are making a statement that I'm going to use the money for this case, that's, that's binding. Uh, and if they don't, if they exploit the investor and they use the funds for a different purpose, you can, you can, or as an investor, we can, as a platform, take legal actions against these companies. Um, um, yeah. And should we go through Easyboat's um, uh, page or? Let's go to the next one. Okay. And then we can the, see. the last one. Yeah, the next the one. Last Any one. other questions on this ah. uh, on this topic? So this is uh, some of the key key things that investors uh, are looking for uh, before investing in a startup and. Um, uh, consequently, these are the key topics, key um, issues that you should tackle in a pitch deck when you are creating a pitch deck mm -hmm. to go out and uh, ask for money from investors. Mm -hmm. Cool. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, structuring your funding rounds. Uh, it's a it's little detail here, uh, but Essentially, what, what, we, what we've seen uh, so far is uh, a lot of startups come to us and ask for a lot of money to take them to profitability from the very, very early stages. That's bad. Why? Because you are, now you're young and you haven't proved a lot. As such, you, you don't have any sales, so your, the valuation of your company is quite low. So if you ask for a lot of money, then you will have to give a lot of a percentage of your company out from this stage. So what can you do instead? You should make a plan 
uh, and split it into different phases and say, for example, uh, to get to where I want to get, I need three phases, three distinct phases, as, as distinct as, as you can. And then you can say, okay, I start with phase one. For phase one, I need 50K. Then you go out and get that 50K to perform phase one. After you do that, then in that way, you give a less percentage of your company outside. And then when you need the other 100K for the second phase, for example, you go out and get that 100K and then you, you have a much higher valuation at that point. So you can give a lot less of your company out in that way. And it can be easier to raise less money uh, in each stage than a lot of money up, up front. So essentially that's the whole spirit of this, of this slide because we've seen a lot of people do that. Uh, we wanted to give this, this advice in general to, to not ask uh, from the very beginning all the funds needed to take you to profitability, make a plan, split it into phases and structure your funding rounds until you reach profitability. Okay, and that's that's pretty much it. Q and A, and we can explore if you want the the uh, campaign. Uh, yeah.